I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and welcome to Scripture and Tradition, where we approach the sacred scripture through the lens of sacred tradition that had been passed on from our Lord to the apostles and from them to their disciples, the bishops that came along the way. Now, of course, we'd love to have you be part of the show. By adding your own questions or comments, you can do so by calling in during the live program, which is Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And if you are in North America, you can call 1-800-221-9460. 1-800-221-9460. If you are not in North America, you can still call, but the number is different. It's country code 1, area code 205 271 2980. You can also send us questions by email. You can uh, write to scripture and tradition at ewtn.com or follow us and participate with the show on Facebook and YouTube. Now, today we'll discuss how our Lord preached and taught and healed in the various synagogues of the Pharisees and Sadducees, well, the Pharisees, and uh, he didn't set up an institution to compete against the Pharisees, but sought to draw all people to the truth. So let's take a look at basically the last meditation of um, the uh, chapter five of my book, which is called Praying the Gospels, Jesus Launches His Public Ministry. You, of course, can get that at EWTNRC.com, our religious catalog. It is item 52687, 52687. Now, the passage that we're dealing with has been from Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 to 25. And today we're going to go to a summary statement. You know, a number of times the evangelists will add their own editorial comments. When you see certain summaries, it's not something that our Lord said, it's the evangelist summarizing, giving his own editorial comment. And you see that here in Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 to 25. It reads there, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria. And they brought to him all the sick, those who were afflicted with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, and paralytics. And he cured them. The great crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Okay. So, this is, again, you can tell just hearing it or reading it if you're reading along with the book, that this is an editorial summary so that you can see basically the background of what's going on at this stage of the gospel. Let's take a look at some parts of it. First, our Lord Jesus remained in Galilee. Galilee is the region up in the north. Of course, it's dominated by the Sea of Galilee, uh, which, uh, why do they call it sea when it's a lake? Because in Hebrew, they don't have a word for lake. That's all. They have one word. See, they were landlubbers. Uh, they, they made a couple of navies and 
when they set out from their maiden journeys, the, both navies sank. People who, had, who lose their ships that quickly are going to say, well, I think we'll just stick to the land. And that's what they did. So they called the Mediterranean a sea, and uh, in Hebrew, yam, and the Red Sea was a sea, but also the Salt Sea, or what we call the Dead Sea, uh, the Yam Melech, and then also the Sea of Galilee, they call it a sea. They just have one word for lakes, seas, oceans, all that, because they weren't interested in it. And that dominates the, that lake, which is only about 12 miles long, seven miles wide. That dominates the, the region and gave it its name. And notice that he, while he's in Galilee, he teaches in their synagogues. Now, the synagogue was an institution founded by the Pharisees and dominated by the Pharisees. The Sadducees dominated the temple. They were from the priesthood. While the Pharisees were not usually priests, there might have been some priests among them, but it was primarily a lay movement. It was non-Levitical uh, Israelites who were there. These were mostly lay people who decided in, within this movement to live out the strict rules for ritual purity. There, you know, priests, when they were serving, had to be very careful about their own ritual purity or their sacrifices would be sacrilegious. So they were very careful about that. The priests and nobles mostly belonged to the Sadduci party. Now, we say Sadduci. It was the Sadduci. They're named after a former high priest named Tzadok. Tzadok. So these were the Tzadokim. And the Pharisees in Hebrew would be the perushtim, perushtim. But some of these sounds don't exist in Greek and then in, not in Latin. And so you go from Hebrew to Greek and then to Latin and then to English. Some of the sounds get lost. So that's, that's why we call them Sadduci and Pharisee. And... One of the issues was this. The priests and the nobles tended to be wealthier and they were in power. This goes back to the Persian period. The Persian emperors wanted the priests to basically be the administrators of Judea, which originally was just the city of Jerusalem. So they put them in charge. And one of the things that developed among the Sadduci party is that they wanted to accommodate themselves to the culture that dominated them. You accommodate to the dominant. And so especially when the Greeks came in under the, the Seleucid Greeks from Syria, they started to act like Greeks. And then when the Romans came in, they started to follow Roman styles and do a lot of things the Romans did. If you read the book of Maccabees, you'll see there that this tension was already going on in the early 2nd century BC. And the Book of Maccabees is very critical of the Sadduci party for acting like Greeks, wearing Greek style clothes and going to the gymnasium like Greeks and so on. While in the Roman times, you go to the houses of the priests. You know, Jerusalem was burned down in 70 AD. 
and you can go to certain parts of contemporary Jerusalem and see the ruins. And you see that their houses are decorated very much like the houses in Pompeii. They followed Roman styles of that era. The only thing missing were the images of the various pagan gods, and they didn't have any of the dirty pictures that you see all over Pompeii, because they were into porn, and they put it on the walls. So, that's our culture agreeing with Pompeii at that point. So, the priests were neglecting the rules of ritual purity. They were so interested in acting like Romans or Greeks, they didn't pay careful attention to the rules they were supposed to be following. So the Pharisee party started up among lay people saying, if the priests are not going to follow the law of Moses, we will. And this tradition of applying that ritual purity to the lay people became dominant in the uh, Pharisee party. And this is going to be very important to understand some of the Pharisee theology. Uh, one of the most important principles that they had was called putting a fence around Torah, putting a fence around the law. In other words, the law of God says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Good, good law. You don't take God's name in vain. So to make sure that you didn't break that law, the, uh, they forbade the use of God's name at all. Nobody could say it except the high priest on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Now, so once a year, the high priest could say the divine name six times during the prayers on Yom Kippur. Nobody else could. That was a fence around Torah. And they did this as a key part of their service. Now, another thing, they met in the synagogues, which is just meeting place, and they would read scripture. They had a lectionary. We get our idea of a lectionary from the Pharisees. It's a, it's a great idea, in fact, that there would be a cycle of readings. Some Pharisees had a one-year cycle, some had a three-year cycle. Uh, they would go through the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah. And in addition to that, they would have what they call the Haftarot. These would be the readings from the prophets and the Psalms, something that's very important our Lord frequently cites. So these would be um, read every Sabbath, Friday night and Saturday morning. So Jesus is not starting uh, something new. He's joining into this Pharisee institution known as the synagogue. Now, St. Matthew notes in this summary that his fame spread through all Syria. Syria was the name of the whole Roman province. We know the country of Syria today, but the Roman province was much larger. Its capital was um, in Antioch, I believe. And with, within that province were a number of minor kings. For instance, Herod. Uh, at the time of Christ, it would be Herod Antipas. Also his brother Philip, who ruled north of the Sea of Galilee. King Aretas ruled in the city of Damascus, uh, in what's today the capital of Syria. And then in Judea, you had the Roman procurator Pontius Pilate because Herod's brother had um, been such a bad leader, the Romans removed him and put a Roman procurator instead. So. Jesus' fame goes throughout all of this region. And St. Luke mentions that the whole province of Syria, which, and he mentions some sections, for instance, the Decapolis. Decapolis means 10 cities. 
when the Roman general Pompey conquered uh, Israel and Judah for Rome, he also set up a district called the Ten Cities. There were ten Gentile cities that included places like Gerasa. Remember the Gerasene demoniac? That's where he was from. Today it's called Jarash. Great, great ruins to go see. It's one of the best preserved Roman cities uh, that you can go see. And Scythopolis, which is on the Israeli side of the Jordan uh, River today, you can go see that also. A great set of ruins uh, to get an idea of a Roman city. Philadelphia, which today is called Amman in Jordan. And there are a number of other cities in this Decapolis. Sometimes there were more than 10, sometimes less than 10, but they stuck with the name Decapolis. And this was set up to be a political balance against the Jewish people getting too much power. And um, those regions all heard about Jesus. And then why'd they hear about him? Well, St. Luke mentions here that he went, he, Jesus preached, healed, and exercised demons. Uh, this was a very important part. And it's what we made reference to a couple weeks ago about how the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 9 comes into play. That, uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 to 2 is quoted a little earlier, as we heard, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 16, where it says, The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. Why is Christ that light? Well, he's healing the blind. He's healing the sick. And he's casting demons out of people. So, again, this is just a summary statement and that we see how Christ is that light shining in the darkness of human experience. Now, even though this is just a summary statement, there's something very important for us to reflect on. You can bring this to your own prayer. And one of the ways I suggest is this. Take a look at our own society. Where do you find areas of shadow and darkness? We had, I think, 106,000 people who died of overdoses from drugs this past year. We have all kinds of people who are breaking up marriages, or even more commonly, more common than breaking up marriage, is living together without getting married in the first place. And sometimes having children, but not being married, not making that commitment to, uh, to spouses and to the children they bring into the world. Take a look how we've seen this increasing violence how many places where people are, groups are just going into stores and forcing the way to steal things. We see, of course, this horrible war going on in Ukraine on a bigger scale. So there are many areas of darkness. Ask yourself this. Where do you want our Lord Jesus to start shining light? in the darkness of our present culture, as people lose more faith in God, as our government in this country forbids us to even teach the Ten Commandments in our schools. You can't teach that anymore. It's a uh, the um, Supreme Court made it unconstitutional. And we see a darkness of stealing and violence and murder in our schools. Because you cannot say to the kids in schools, thou shalt not kill. You can't say that. I would consider that darkness. But what are some of the areas of darkness you might see? And what would you think are some of the teachings 
that our culture needs to hear from Jesus. We have many people conforming to very secular mentalities and sinful mentalities, whether it's pornography and all sorts of other things, very violent behavior, people getting shot. Ten people were shot in the subways in New York, 28 in Chicago this past weekend alone. That's darkness. That's shadow. What would you want Jesus to preach in our culture? And when it comes to healing, where would you want him to bring healing? What are the areas of healing that are needed in our society? What are some of the demons that need to be exercised, not only from individuals, but demonic attitudes that occur in our society? Always remember that our Lord taught that Satan is a liar and the father of lies and a murderer from the beginning. People who use death to, to solve our problems. Ask the Lord, imagine yourself just speaking to the Lord and ask Him to show compassion on this society and where we need to find healing and reconciliation. And do so from the perspective of John 3.16. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son so that everyone who believes in Him may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Take that passage and consider it. In, as the light shining in the darknesses of our own culture and perhaps conclude that with the prayer, soul of Christ, sanctify me, body of Christ, save me, blood of Christ, inebriate me, water from the side of Christ, wash me, passion of Christ, strengthen me. Oh, good Jesus, hear me within your wounds, hide me. Let me never be separated from you from the wicked foe, defend me, and at the hour of my death, call me and bid me come to you, so that with your angels and saints I might praise you for all eternity. I'm going to come back in just a minute and start taking a look at chapter 6 from my book and our Lord's ministry in the town of Capernaum. So please stay with us. Welcome back. We're going to start chapter 6 of my book, which is about the uh, mission that Jesus had to the city of Capernaum. And there are a number of events there that are very important, um, including the first one where th there's an exorcism. But before, we're going to just start off with Mark. We're going to go to the Gospel of Mark chapter 1. In verse, and this is going to entail verses 21 to 34, but we'll just talk about the introduction now. In chapter 1, verses 21 to 22. Again, this is something of St. Mark the Evangelist giving his own editorial summary of what was going on. It says in Mark chapter 1, verse 21 to 22, they went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now, first of all, we, we know from both uh, Matthew and Mark, as well as from St. Luke, that our Lord called the apostles for them, 
James and John, and then uh, uh, their partners, Peter and Andrew, two sets of brothers. And it's pro they were fishermen. Uh, Capernaum is right on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, it's a fishing town, was a fishing town in our Lord's day. And presumably it was close to, the, the call came close to Capernaum because they were, uh, you know, uh, living in Capernaum. So they're presumably fishing near their, their town. And the city, Capernaum, we say Capernaum. Again, this is a problem that comes in Greek because Greek doesn't have the letter H or the equivalent of an H. And you can get a, an H sound at the beginning of a word with a little rough breathing mark, but otherwise you can't. So how would the city have been named in our Lord's day? Kfar Nahum. Kfar means village. Nahum is the name of some guy, Nahum, Nahum, like the prophet Nahum. So Nahum is a name. And so this is the village of Nahum, probably the guy who founded it or paid for some of the first buildings. You know, it's just like Alexander the Great named Alexandria after himself. You know, that's how they did things. Antioch after his general Antiochus. So, this is the name of the town. And when you go there, you see that the buildings are made out of a dark gray basalt. This was all very volcanic. There's not very far away of the horns of Hattin. That was a that's now an extinct volcano, and you go up the Jordan Valley and you see volcanoes all along. The, they're all extinct now, um, but there, there are lots and lots of volcanoes because it's right on a major fault. And you can see in your screen uh, pictures of the, um, some of the basalt, you know, the, the, that dark gray stone. The whole town was built like that. Basalt is strong but brittle, so they would have to make it in smaller pieces. And the, uh, one of the things here is that they're in the town in uh, a Sabbath, and you can see in the picture on your screen that there's a white building with gray stones all around it. And if you look at the white, that's limestone. And that was from a synagogue built in the 4th century A.D. But if you look below the white limestone, you could see that there was black basalt. The original synagogue was that foundation. That foundation is still there. That's from the synagogue at the time of Christ. But in the 4th century, they did a new building with limestone, which was considered more uh, uh, beautiful. And you, when you go to Capernaum, you can still walk around the synagogue again. This is the fourth century limestone uh, that you see here. But right underneath it is the black basalt uh, foundation of this and, and floor of the synagogue that Jesus lived in, or walked in. So that's, that's a place that you can be 100% sure this is where our Lord went and prayed. There's, there's no, no doubts about that. Um, and there are a couple things here to notice. First, this comment in verse 22 that the crowd was astonished at his teaching for he taught them as one who had authority, not as the scribes. The scribes were the educated people among the Pharisee party. They were the, the theologians among the Pharisees. And the way that they would teach is to quote a variety of rabbinic sources. Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai says this. However, Rabbi Yitzchak says this. But on the other hand, Rabbi Issachar said we should do it like this. But Rabbi Zebulun said this. 
and they would present the opinions of all the different rabbis that they knew and work through it. This is uh, still taught. You know, you study Mishnah and Talmud uh, in a Jewish school, and you know, debating these things is part of the education process, so you learn how to make sense out of life. So that's a very important thing. And this is something that we see as different in Jesus' teaching. He never quotes any of the rabbis. He doesn't make any reference to them. Everything is just him stating this. It's all on his authority. But then when asked about that authority, he says, everything I have, I have from the Father. So ultimately, God the Father is the source of the authority, and Jesus the Son uh, speaks on his own authority that he gets from the Father. When he did parables, he didn't make reference to any rabbis, but he simply teaches about the coming of the kingdom of God and that he's the one who's supposed to bring that in. When he gives moral teaching, He'll quote the commandments. For instance, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 following, it says, You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not murder. So that's the fifth commandment, right? Thou shalt not murder. And whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But then Jesus teaches on his own authority and says, But I say to you, that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you'll be liable to judgment. If you insult a brother or sister, you'll be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, raka, you'll be liable to the hell of fire. So, um, and the word fool is a very special one. When you say that word, raka, then that is the worst kind of fool. And that can start a, 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 a feud that lasts for generations. That's why it's so forbidden. It's not, there are other words for fool that our Lord does use, but not that one. And, that, uh, and that's why he says, so if you're going to offer your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're on the way to court with him or your accuser may hand you over to the judge, the judge to the guard, and you'll be thrown in prison. And truly I tell you, you'll never get out until you paid the last penny. It's, notice how it's all what he says, and truly I tell you. He doesn't say, but Rabbi Shammai said this, and so on. He does this about the, the commandment, you shall not commit adultery, that's the commandment. But I say to you that everyone who looks with lust at somebody, that's enough. So he also gives his own authority so that you go more deeply into the core meaning of the commandments. This is a very important part. So here's something that I would recommend for you as a way to pray through this, again, summary statement from St. Mark. Imagine yourself, use your imagination. You saw a photograph of that synagogue, you go online, you can see all kinds of photographs of the synagogue at Capernaum. And imagine yourself sitting on the floor. They didn't have pews or chairs. You sat on the floor on a mat, and you're sitting there listening to Jesus teach. And a couple questions is that he, since he doesn't mention any of the rabbis that you're familiar with, with, you begin to ask, do I accept Jesus or not? Do I believe his authority? Do, do I let the resonance of his authority come into my life or do I reject him? And believe me, many people do not want. I remember a, I was teaching about the Sermon on the Mount in college class. And when it said that you don't even look at with lust at somebody, the class broke out in laughter. They were laughing at the idea that you wouldn't be lustful. And they take lust for granted. They're watching porn all the time. 
So then they caught themselves. They began to realize, oh, oh, I am making fun of the teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. And as they began, they stopped laughing. They caught themselves. And I said to them, our Lord Jesus means it. And we let it at that. But this is, do we accept his authority? And we have to take a look then at our culture. Because the culture says, well, we've got new developments. We're growing in, in our understanding. So we want abortion available and pornography. And if people are in pain, we want to do mercy killing. And, you know, we think marriage is too limiting. We have to expand marriage and what it means. And sex outside of marriage and divorce, all these things. These are modern trends and we have to get with it. And the question we have to then ask ourselves, do I accept authority from Hollywood and the media? Or do I accept the authority of the teaching of Jesus Christ? That is what's, what's going on. And what I recommend is that you speak to Jesus our Lord. Imagine yourself talking to him back in the synagogue. And in the synagogues, they go back and forth as you see in the Gospels, and ask him, how does, this, how does your teaching apply to me? What are you asking of me? What do you want me to do? That's what I would do. And again, conclude with the same prayer we mentioned earlier, the soul of Christ. Um, and make that a way to meditate on this Gospel passage. Next week, we will continue on in Mark chapter 1 and take a look at the exorcism of the possessed man in that synagogue. So we'll talk to you about that next week. Now we'll take a call. We have James calling. James, where are you calling from? Haverly, North Carolina, Father. Great, great. And what can we do for you? Uh, I have a question, if you could explain the history of the white collar, the Roman collar that the Catholic priest wears, there is mm -hmm. a sin which is, uh, psychiatrists call it, where somebody kills a person. Uh, could you could you explain that? Wait, the, what, what did you hear, that somebody killed a person? No, no, uh, there's, a, there's a sin that psychiatrists call where a person gets killed. Uh, they uh, commit the sin of sexual self-manipulation. Oh. They say they want it, and their life is changed. Uh, well, I don't. That has, doesn't have anything to do with clerical dress. <laughs> uh, let me uh, let me give you some background. Going all the way back to the second century A.D., clergy, Catholic clergy started to wear black. Now, when you've seen, James, you've seen movies about ancient Rome, haven't you? Yes. All right. And what color is most of the togas? I don't know what the toga is. Oh, the, oh a toga. You know, the, 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 the kind of uh, clothes that the Romans would wear? It's sort of draped around them? Yes. And it's usually white, right? Uh-huh. Well, back in the second century, to distinguish themselves, Catholic clergy started to wear black. That was considered very odd, uh, but they started to wear black. And the wearing of black uh, became normal for clergy down to this day. I always like to tell people, you know, my mom is dead. I don't have a wife. Wearing black is one way to make all my clothes match. But be that as it may. Um, this is uh, uh, something to set them apart, you know, and, and that they wouldn't be able to be running around doing monkey business uh, wearing their black. So then various styles of collars. So, for instance, this is called a Roman collar because this is the, the style that they wore in Rome. Whereas in France, they would have, uh, you know, uh, you've probably seen pictures 
from the 18th century where men would have not exactly a tie, but a white cloth that came down from under their, their chin, around, around their neck and down onto their chest. And that was a French collar. And the clergy were black with a white collar there. Uh, and uh, again, to indicate that they're clergy. And the idea of wearing clerical uh, garb is also like policemen who are wearing their uniform. It's a way of saying that we're on duty, that we are available for our priestly ministry, whether we're in church or whether we're walking around, but we're always priests. And so uh, that's where that came from. But it was just the, the style of, that I wear, Roman collar, just was a style that was used in Rome as opposed to the French collar. Uh, and that's that was the only difference. Okay? So Thank you very that. much, Father Brian. You're Have welcome. A blessed day. You do the same. All right, let's take a break, and we'll come back with more of your questions and emails. Please stay with us. Welcome back. We have another caller also named Jim. Jim, where are you calling from? From New Hampshire. Great. Good to have you with us. What can we do for you this fine day? Um, I've got a question um, about um, we're, we're trying to evangelize our grandkids. They're in their teenagers here. Uh -huh. And um, one of them come up and said um, that Eve wasn't the first woman that God created. Uh -huh. He said that the, he created Lilith first. And uh, we kind of uh, disagreed with that. And then he said, well, she's in the Bible in Isaiah chapter 34, verse 14. And so we looked it up, and sh sure enough, her name, Lilith, is in there. But it didn't say anything about her being the first woman. I was wondering if you could... Um, explain uh, something about that so that we can tell them that, no, they're not right. Or, yeah, they are. Yeah, um, I'm looking here. Uh, I don't see Lilith in my, uh, no, my Bible here at all. And I'm checking out a couple of spellings, none of them are there. And you said it's in Isaiah? Yeah, Isaiah chapter 34. 34. Which and verse? That refers to uh, her name as herself. Uh, wait, w which verse of Isaiah? Th verse 14. Isaiah 34, verse. And. There's no mention of Lilith in that verse. The wild beast shall meet with hyenas, <coughs> and the satyr. Yep, that's the verse. Yep. Yeah, and the satyr shall cry to his fellow, and there shall be the night hag alight, and find for herself a resting place. Right, and in uh, the in the NRSV Bible, the Catholic version. Um, it says Lilith. Oh, there it is. Yeah, in Hebrew. Yeah. Uh, Hergia Lilith. Uh, so, yeah, it is in Hebrew, and it's this um, hag. Now, it doesn't say in that verse that she was Adam's first wife, does it? No, it doesn't. There's that... That is a, the idea that she was Adam's first wife is a medieval Jewish legend. 
I don't know of it uh, predate. There's certainly nothing that I know of in the earliest literature, and there's no mention of Lilith as a wife of Adam before Eve. There's nothing saying that in there. And usually Lilith is uh, a character, there, there's again a medieval legend that she was created from the earth like Adam was. And because she was created from the earth, she was not derived from him and therefore she became arrogant and she was kicked out of paradise before Adam. That was, that was the legend. And that she wanders through the earth killing babies at night. This was used to explain what we call SIDS, you know, sudden infant death syndrome, where babies, for no apparent reason, die. And so that's where that came from. But your, you know, your grandchildren are told this without it being in the text that she was a wife before Eve. There's nothing that says that. And that was a surmisal that was invented in the Middle Ages. I'll see what I can do to find out the earliest reference to uh, the, those medieval legends, but it's certainly not anything that's biblical, okay? All right, let's now go to another caller named Helen. Helen, where are you calling from? Helen? Are you there? Oh, I don't see, I don't think so. All right, well, um, we'll, we'll see if we can get back to her. A um, couple things, let's take a look at an email from Vincent. Dear Father Mitch, why would an all-loving God make it hard for people to enter the kingdom of God? Or why would he allow it to be so easy for people not to enter paradise for all eternity? I know this is a great mystery, so I welcome any of your insights. Well, Vincent, let's take a look at this. Um, I've known uh, quite a number of coaches. And when you have, uh, let's just, I think a couple of examples I know of uh, for, who are football coaches. And the football coaches who made it very easy to get on the football team and kind of easy to stay on the team also happened to be the coaches who coached losing teams. While coaches I've known who may, were very tough, they would have to do two practices a day in the summer heat. And they would do all these drills. And if you mess up, if you do something wrong, you have to run extra laps. You have to do extra push-ups. And those coaches tend to win games more than the coaches who make it very easy to get on the team and stay. This is part of why entering heaven has this challenge to it. Just like the 13 and 14 year old boys who all want to be football stars, but are not they're gonna get creamed and hurt badly if they don't practice hard and build up their muscles and get you know core body strength. We also come to the you know the, the spiritual combat of life as a bunch of weaklings. We're prone to fall into sin. We have all kinds of desires and distractions. And we need to have that tough training. 
so that we can engage in spiritual combat and win the ultimate goal, which is to be in heaven and to have spirits that are strong enough to stand heaven. Heaven is not a place for wimps. This is a place where you can't bring anger, can't bring lust, can't bring selfishness, you can't bring greed. None of those vices can get into heaven. So you need to get those worked out. Just like, you know, 90-pound weaklings are not going to be linebackers in a college football game. You need to be trained up. And that's the way it goes with heaven as well. Okay? That's why it's the way it is. All right, let's go to Helen. You, are you there, Helen? Yes, I am. Good afternoon. Great. Where Father are you Pacwa. from? I live in North Carolina, but I am from Canada. Okay, great. And what is your question or comment? Well, earlier today, uh, you mentioned that, uh, I think it is from John, that uh, it says, whoever believes in me will have eternal life, or mm -hmm. some version says, who believe in him will have eternal life. Mm -hmm. Yes, if we believe and follow his, uh, his commandment, we will have eternal life. Mm -hmm. But it seems that some soul in, in hell supposedly did believe in him, but he didn't want to go to heaven. Mm -hmm. Will they be in hell for eternal life also? And my second part is, uh, those who never heard about Jesus and God, uh, what will happen to them after their death? Sure. Okay, there are, for those who choose to disbelieve in Jesus, they say, no, I don't want to follow Jesus. Then they won't have to, but they'll end up in hell. I mean, that's, that is a specific rejection of our Lord. You reject him, then you reject his offer of heaven. However, your second question is also to the point. What about those who never heard of Christ? Remember Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 and following, where people are, are told, the, the, the sheep on the right, that I was hungry, thirsty, naked, and uh, in prison, and you helped me. They said, we never saw you like that. I said, when you did it to the least of my brethren, you did it to me. Or if you failed to do it to the least brethren, you failed to do it to Jesus. Now, these people don't know Jesus. They don't know him. They don't recognize him. And that even when you look at the beginning of that uh, verse 31, Matthew 25, 31, this is addressed to the Gentiles, to the nations who don't know Christ. And what they did, in, in ignorance, that's not their fault, what they did to the least of people, the ones who couldn't help them back, Jesus counts that as done to him. And he'll save them. He's still the Savior. But they didn't get a chance to know him for, through no fault of their own. They'll have a different judgment than those of us who do know him. All right, I am out of time. Lord bless you all and keep you the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And again, please keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we'll be able to pay all of our bills too. God bless you all, and thank you.